Hi, everybody. Um, welcome back to Ballpark Figures. I am Shakia, your host. Um, I am a writer at the Chicago Tribune. And tonight's guest, I am someone I am super excited to talk to. I talk to him pretty much in my regular life anyway, because we're friends. But it's Clint Yates. He is a columnist, TV commentator, and host for ESPN since 2016. He helped launch The Undefeated and writes regularly for Anscape. He also appears on Around the Horn, Outside the Lines, ESPN Radio, and other programs. Prior to ESPN, Yates worked for the Washington Post for nine years. He is a native of DC. What's up? <laughs> I'm having trouble hearing. Hold on one second. I'm so sorry. I think it's me too. Hello, hello, hello. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. All right, Clinton. Let's let's get to it. I want to know how you came up with snag, grab, or stab. Let me just use, can I just use the regular mic? Does it sound okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what it was was, you know, Jake Mintz? Yep. Jake Mintz of Cespedes BBQ, he was like, Jake was a pitcher and I played infielder. So he would always ask me like, what do you think of this catch? How would you describe this catch? And he would ask me this question over and over again, like with various grabs and, or catches, excuse me. And I would always say, I don't know, that's a snag. I don't know if that's a grab, you know? And then it became this whole game and sneaky secret back in um, like the first couple of years that I did it, it was only for the purposes of highlighting like players who look like us, but yep. I sort of expanded it also to softball and college players. Cause I just thought it made a little bit more sense to give some shine to different people. And I don't know, it's a fun game. You know, I, I was, I, I like fielding. That's like the biggest part about baseball that I like after, I mean, before rather before base running is fielding before hitting, you know, so it's always just a fun way to highlight something that I like. Um, you got to explain that ranking right there. You said fielding, base running, hitting. I played middle infield. So fielding was number one. Your ability to get your hands and your feet moving on the dirt was the most important thing to me. And it was also the most fun part of it. Like, you know, people talk about personalities. People talk about this, that, and the third. Like, I actually like baseball. Like, the actual plays that happen on the field are the most important to me. So Fueling was number one. Base running was probably the thing I was second best at, you know, and that doesn't just mean stolen bases, y'all. You know what I'm saying? That means your ability to get around the bags and your ability to not get out and your ability to score runs. And after that comes hitting, you know, hitting is an art that everybody has to do in order to be able to play. And it's assumed that it's always going to be the number one thing. But for me, it's it, that's always going to be there. If you can do the other two things first, you're probably going to be a pretty good player. So you played, <clears throat> where'd you play? How long did you play? And of course, I, were you I never, good? I was not some big time player. Don't get me wrong. I was reasonably good, but I played on the first two. I played traveling in, in, in high school and I played on the first two RBI teams in DC. And after that, because of my family situation, you know, it was a little tough to sort of acclimate to a real baseball career and it was difficult, but I played till I was 17 till, you know, when I, I never played T-ball. I just walked into little league and I thought it was real fun, but I got to play on my little league all-star team and we didn't get far, but that experience with um, my man, coach Mac, who still runs the home run baseball camp at turtle park in DC, you know, it was a life changer. It was one of those where he said, just give me two weeks, guys, you know, give me two weeks of your lives and you're probably going to be a better baseball player. And you're probably going to be a better human. And he was right. And, you know, I learned a lot about life and learned a lot about how to, how to be a teammate, how to be a, um, how to be like a, a decent person. You know, when you're a kid, you never really know who's going to teach you the right way to go. And mm -hmm. coach Mack was a guy that did that. And ironically, getting back to Jake, Jake was a guy that ended up working for and knows Mack better than I do, to be quite honest. I only played on one all-star team with him. And, uh, you know, so it's sort of a small DC baseball circle that we come from, but it's uh, really something that um, I enjoy and it really makes me who I am. Okay, you said you 
learned a lot about life through baseball. You know, I'm gonna ask you like, like, can you give us examples? Can you talk about it? Take us on a little journey with that? Yeah, for sure. Um, the number one thing was showing up on time. That was big. Um, you know, because if you're wasting coach's time, then he can't help you with your time. That was huge. The number two thing was respect for your teammates, which was basically you're all here for each other. If either one of you doesn't want to try hard, then what are you doing here? That was number two. And like the third thing is something that's a little harder to describe, but it was basically compete and give it your best. And that's, 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 that sounds so basic. But when you're a young person who is always, you know, how when you're a preteen, you're always given limits on things. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. That's against the rules. You better do this or something screwed up. He tried to put ourselves in a practice situation where it was like, yo, go all out. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what we need. And if that's not good enough, that's fine. But that's what you're supposed to do. And you sort of learn when you can give the best parts of yourself versus when you're supposed to do other things. It was the first team I ever played on where we picked each other up, meaning when you got back to the dugout, you had infield and outfield piles. You put your hat in your glove, and when your guy got left on base, you knew who your guy was who was going to pick it up and take it out to him. You mm -hmm. got it around after outs. You just made sure that every single person on the team was a part of every single thing you did as best you could. And now I'd like to consider myself a pretty reasonable teammate when it comes to applications outside of baseball. Um, how do you bring your love of baseball to work with you every day? Oh, wow. Um, probably a lot of really bad metaphors about a lot of things in terms of abilities to get things done. Mm -hmm. I told somebody today, I was teaching a class at UVA. And one of the things I said when it comes to taking risks in life and your ability to execute, can't hit the ball if you don't swing, you know? And so there's a lot of sort of basic lessons through, I think things that are kind of, they sound kind of average on a baseball field, but like, that's that's real, you know, and the idea of you got to go one base at a time and the idea of don't try to hit homers and the idea of the best the player, the best player on any baseball team is typically the player that scores the most runs, as in you actually complete the task over and over again. Look that up, kiddos, if you're ever wondering if you don't know a team, you want to see who the best player on the team is, look at the guy who scored the most runs or the lady who scored the most runs. That's probably the best player because they're the ones that know how to complete the task the best. And so all that stuff sort of comes together and you know, for a while, I was a high school baseball coach, and I did not realize how much of Coach Mack was in me until mm -hmm. I, like, got out on the field and started hitting fungos. Next thing you know, I'm talking like this guy that taught me 20 years prior, and I was just like, oh, my goodness, this actually really works, you know what I mean, in more context than just regular life. So I think for me, it's just the idea that, you know, life is untimed sort of the way baseball is, pitch clock aside, don't get on me y'all. But, you know, and you just, you want to make sure that you maximize your opportunities. Baseball is technically a game of ordered pairs if for you math heads out there. And so if you don't maximize your opportunities in the moment, well, then what are you playing for? So you just gave me two different directions I could go. Like, I feel like I want to talk about the pitch clock, but now I don't want to talk about it this early. No, we can um, save it. We can save it. <laughs> um, but I, I do want to talk about how a lot of your work focuses on Black history within the sport. Um, how do you find those stories? They're always so unique. Um, where do they come from? Well, I appreciate that, first of all, Sheikh. And the easiest way, and I'll, I'll go to the, from the general to the specific, the number one way is showing up at the yard. That's the easiest way to find stories. Young journalists out there, if you're not at the park, if you're not at the field, if you're not at the court, if you're not at the rink, you're not going to get the stories. That's one thing. And I don't mean to say that as in if you're doing it, otherwise you're not doing it right. I just mean to say that I'm a little bit old school like that. You know what I'm saying? When I was a high school basketball player, I went to the gym for games I wasn't playing in. I went to other tournaments. Same thing in baseball and not really as much in soccer, but, you know, whatever. My point is, is that being around these guys and being around the sport will always teach you more. And so for me, I'm 42 years old. It's my Jackie Robinson year. And so a lot of the guys that were my favorite players were not, listen, I love Ken Griffey. I love Frank Thomas. I love Barry Bonds. But my favorite players were the Sean Dunstans, you know what I'm saying? The Charles Johnsons, you know, guys who were just dudes in the league. And once I started to meet a lot of those guys as a result of covering other brothers, I learned a lot about how the multitude of roots that are around the game from the standpoint of, you know, brothers who 
were in it and did it the right way. You know, I talked to a guy, Marvin Freeman, who pitched for the Braves for 10 years, and he was a Rockies pitcher as well. He's online all the time, breaking down his pitching. He's an instructor. And just the stories these guys told, they reminded me of stories of my aunt, my uncles, you know what I'm saying? My cousins, older Bamas from the neighborhood who were just, this is how you got by. Now, those guys weren't big leaguers, but the idea of the struggle of a certain era in America was very relatable. You know what I'm saying? And that, that made a ton of sense. And so, you know, you just follow the love, you know, and sure. Like, am I in a position where I can focus on that because I don't really have to do anything else, so to speak. I mean, I, I, I mean, I do a lot of other things, but like, yeah, I, I try to be laser focused because, mm -hmm. you know, the fact is, is that a lot of part of this is, I'll be honest, building on something I couldn't do. And I'm not mad about that. You know what I mean? And I will definitely tell the story of anybody, how they got, from soup to nuts, because everybody thinks that you just come out of the womb banging yams. No way, not even close. And that doesn't just go for black ball players, that goes for everybody. I just try to tell the stories because a lot of us kind of feel like we're all the superstars. What's going on? I'm like, that's really not how any of this works, you know? And so by telling the tales of all the guys along the way and all the women and families and everybody else along the way for all these players, I think it kind of humanizes what everybody else is doing. Um, you've written some, some stories of late, um, that I really enjoyed. I really like when you go talk to the coaches. I really, I really, I really like when you have those like uncle nephew type conversations Thank with you. people. Um, but there's someone you have a relationship with who I am so fascinated by. Jerry Manuel. Tell me about oh. Jerry. So, okay. So the first time I ever went to Dream Series, for those of you who don't know what Dream Series is, it's part of MLB's Breakthrough Series program. It started with a camp slash showcase in Tempe, Arizona, home of the California, not California, Anaheim Angels AAA team, Diablo Field. And I had met some of the guys who were involved with it earlier in the year, because that was the year that the all-star game was going to come to DC. Mm -hmm. And so we got into this conversation about little league and RBI. And the guy was like, what do you know about RBI? And I'm like, bro, like, what are you talking about? What kind of question is that? I played in that. And he was like, you need to know about dream series. So I go, right. And I had met Del Matthews, just Del, son of Sarge. If you don't know who Gary Matthews is, look him up. You have not done the prerequisite reading kiddos. And, um, <laughs> he was like yo what do you want to do I was like I want to be everywhere and he was like you sure because like these brothers ain't no joke and I was like I'm sure and so we went into the first coaches meeting and you know everybody introduces themselves they all know each other these brothers have all been big leaguers they've known each other forever I'm the new guy Dell says quickly after Jerry's initial remarks he says I'd like you guys to meet somebody. This is Yates, yada, 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 yada. And they're all looking at me like, okay, y'all got some brother up in here. We don't know who this, that, and the third is. Let's just <laughs> say that I had some flavorful words for everybody of support. And they were all like, okay, all right, we got you. And ever since then, you know, Jerry was like, I feel you, man. And so, you know, you just keep showing up. You just keep making sure that you're respecting what guys are doing and you keep getting invited back. You know, each one teach one, you know how it is. How do you feel about the World Baseball Classic? How do you do in the World Baseball Classic? I think the World Baseball Classic was an, a bit of an eye opener, um, you know, for I think a lot of squads because, you know, number one, I don't know that anybody knew how popular it was going to be. It was the first one coming back after the pandemic. There were some questions about, I don't say questions about roster construction, but you never really know. Shouts to Tony Regans, by the way, GM of Team USA. I think he did a great job. Um, constructing that roster in that coaching staff. Luke Collier um, was there as well. Obviously, Ken Griffey Jr. was there as well. And, you know, I, I think that the words of Devin Williams, airbender from the Brewers, he said it best. He was like, I, he's like, look, bro, I just grew up playing baseball because I was good at it. I never thought I'd be walking amongst these greats, never mind learning from them, never mind breaking bread with them, and never mind competing with them. And so, to see Jerry there was almost, it was one of the more hands, not I want to say hands off, but like normally Jerry runs the show. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? In this case, he was part of the squad and it was really good to see all those guys come together. And that dude, man, you know, he's a man of faith and, you know, I don't go to church enough, but I respect how things move. It, it's really is 
quite inspiring to see how his entire family, not just him, operates based on those principles. For those who don't know, Jerry Lorenzo is a son, fear of God, um, you know, fashion extraordinaire guy. And so they're a very successful family on a lot of fronts. And if you meet any of them, I met his daughters and, you know, Jerry and his sisters as well, you know, doing a couple different stories and like, they come correct. And, you know, they're just a family that's been about baseball. It's given them a lot of gifts. And so they give back and Jerry, Jerry embodies that better than anybody. Oh, I love that. That's so cool. Yeah. Oh, what a cool family. Um, so I want to talk about TV. You know, okay. I'm not a big fan of being on camera um, <laughs> and you manage to do it pretty frequently. How do you win on Around the Horn? Like, oh my God, everybody think, asks this question all the time. I want to um, know. And I'm thinking so, other people want to know too. Like, because I don't even understand the point system. What is Tony doing? Like, first of all, shouts to Tony Reale, host to Brown Tony. Horn. All right, we love <laughs> Anthony William Joseph Reale. But um, let me just say this when I've hosted the show, I give points to people that make me laugh. That's my system. You know okay. what I'm saying? You want to know Tony's system? You can ask Tony. There's a bit of a okay. timing mechanism in terms of just making sure it keeps it moving, but that's that's how I do it. And, you know, the thing about the show that's great is, number one, the mix of personalities that are there. You know, I've made a ton of friends through that show, and I've learned a lot about who I am as a person, never mind a journalist. And, you know, like, bro, everybody thinks they can do that. And a lot of people maybe could, but like, you know, it's all on tape, you know, so you can't come incorrect because people will know, oh, you said this last week, you said that last week, you know, nah, you've got to be consistent. You can't just be, you know, the idiot at the bar that said one thing on Tuesday and then on Wednesday, you're like, nah, that's not actually what I meant because <laughs> you got to be accountable, you know, and that's a big part of it. And so for me, the accountability is almost the fun part, you know, I get a couple of things right every once in a while, shake, you know, so. I mean, you got to be mentally quick as well. Like you have to be ready for for whatever the topic or of conversation is. Um, I also like that there's 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 some really smart women yes. on there. Um, and that's not something that we get to see, you know, people do a lot, like include the very smart sports women. Um shouts there- to Monica, shouts to <laughs> Emily, shouts to Courtney, shouts to Sarah Spain. You know, there's a lot of people, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying, that are on the show that for me. If it doesn't look like that, I ain't doing it. You know what I'm saying? There's a part of that element to it as well, you know? And so I'm glad that over the years, we've been able to grow and expand and diversify diversify our bonds. Some of y'all will get that joke, but, um, you know, yeah, that's what we do. It's fun. Um, I get that joke. I say that a lot. That's very funny. Um, so... <laughs> Sorry, you just threw it's me okay. off. That's a Dave Chappelle Wu-Tang <laughs> joke. Go look it up. I didn't say the last word in that part, but that's another story. Shake's going to lose it. If I keep oh talking. my goodness. You completely. Okay. So this season, we're about what a week into the season. Yeah. Um, who are you liking so far? Let's get into the pitch clock stuff. Okay. Um, okay. So the team that I think is the most disappointing so far for a lot of different reasons is the Philadelphia Phillies. Not close. They have not looked good. That was a world series team last year and they were a buzzsaw. They were sort of a mini buzzsaw. Remember when the Nats won in 2019 and Steven Strasburg said, sometimes you're the buzzsaw. The Phils were that right up until they ran into Dusty. You know, they were a good looking team. They busted about a lot of people up that thought that they were good, you know, between the Padres and all sorts of other people. They've been a real disappointment. However, they also beat the Braves during that run, and the Atlanta Braves are the best team in baseball. I don't think it's particularly close right now. I got my dudes over here talking trash. They can't even keep it down. Anyway, um, <laughs> enough. Thank you. You're talking. So anyway, so the Braves are the best team. I think they've also got one of the better roster constructions in the league overall. You know, AA has put – guys, thank you. AA has put together a squad in which they've got a lot of long-term guys locked up, young dudes who basically are the core of that squad, and they're going to be the same squad for the next five or six years. And that's all you can really ask for these days in age. Guys are signing 10, 13-year contracts. That's not realistic to actually building a team. And they were already good. Reminder, when they made that first run, they had the least wins in the playoffs with 88. And then they won it, and you're like, yo, like they also have a two-black man base coach situation between my man EY and Uncle Ron. We love Uncle Ron. So I'm not just liking them because of that. I think they're one of the better constructed baseball teams between staff and lineup in the big leagues. Hmm. Hmm. 
What do we think about the Padres? I've seen a lot of talk about the Padres. Like, it feels like the Padres come with hype at the beginning of the season. And then at the end of the season, everyone's like, oh, I, I never said that. Yeah. <laughs> there is a belief that the Padres can never get over the hill. But let's not forget that the Padres popped the Dodgers in the playoffs last year. The Dodgers were not prepared for what the pods had. And I think if you're a Padres fan, that's a stepping stone. Um, they bolstered their infield between Bogarts and, you know, other guys. And I, I look, if it's not going to happen this year for the pods, okay. But like, I think that this is finally a season that they can walk into, especially with the change in the schedule, the unbalanced schedule change helps a lot of teams in places where like, for example, the Dodgers were dominating divisions forever. And so I think the Dodgers are going to take a big hit this year in terms of wins um, on the season. You know, I think they'll be closer to 85 to 90 versus hundred to hundred plus just because of the amount of games that they have to play against better teams. And so the Padres can take advantage of something like that. And I think also there's something to be said about if you've beaten the team you were supposed to lose to every year, if you get back into another situation with them, you believe in it, you know, like they're, they're you know, that's one of the things about baseball that I really love is that there's a psychology of the game that because it's so long, because you play series, if you vanquish somebody, you remember it, you know, they're, they're not a whole lot of one game upsets that really, really matter in, in, in baseball. And so the pods have, have it laid out in front of them a little bit. And, um, I, you know, Manny Machado, I think is a guy, regardless of him getting tossed for a, you know, pitch clock violation the other night, I think he's actually really been one of the better leaders for that squad the last couple of seasons, you know, with Tatis acting like a complete knucklehead, you know, right. and a lot of other things going on, like Tatis has held it together. I mean, excuse me, Machado was held it together. And, you know, Ron Washington was supposed to get that job. He didn't. I'm not going to get into that, you know, but they managed to put together a pretty good product and they're fun to watch. If you've never been to Slam Diego, as they call it, you should get out there and watch a game at Petco. It's a real good time. Okay. Um, speaking of pitch clock, right? I yeah. my thought on the pitch clock was, so I was agnostic. I didn't care one way or the other. Right? <laughs> agnostic. Because I just don't care. If I can go and still have my beers and enjoy the right. game, I don't care. Don't put it on the screen, though. I don't want to see it on TV. That, that's Yes, I agree with you on that. Yeah. Like, I don't want to see it on TV. But my thinking was or is that eventually we'll all forget it's there. And the game will continue and the conversation will probably cease. And maybe it won't be such an ump show, you know, as it progresses. Right. Do you think for you personally, you're going to enjoy it later because you're not a fan of it now. No, no, that's not true. I love it. Okay, um, okay. What I don't, yeah, no, what I don't like is having it on the TV screen during the telecast. Okay. I'm with you on that. Like, I don't need to look at it if I'm watching a game on television for the main reason that I'm not going to look at it if I'm watching a game in the yard. Now, that being said, I remember, I'll tell you the story, and I might have told you this before, but the first time I ever went to a pitch clock game, first of all, I didn't know the clock was going to be there, and I didn't know I was going to the park that night. I was just mm -hmm. doing something. I happened to be in Nashville, home of the stars. You never been to a Stars game? They got one of the better um, big head races in the history of minor league baseball. They got four country stars. It's fantastic. They do it every night. It's like the sausages, the racing presidents, all that. But they got country stars. It's fantastic. So I'm going to the game thinking, I got a night to kill in Nashville. <laughs> Let me go to the park. Mm -hmm. There was a pitch clock. It was nine innings. That thing ended in 215 lickety split. And I was like, what? Oh, okay, I guess I got to make other plans. Like, I, I was... And I, it wasn't like I was thinking about it. I was just at the game and, I, you know, I yeah. scored the game. And I just remember thinking, wow, that was efficient and it was better baseball. And when people talk about the pitch clock, you know, from a TV product standpoint, yeah, it makes the game shorter. But the truth is, is that if you're at the game, if you know baseball, it actually improves the quality of play on the field. And I say this, you know, from a player standpoint, you're on the field. The guy's taking forever to work enough already you know what i'm saying you get tired right. there's more errors you lose concentration and i just think that the pitch clock improves the game as much as it speeds it up and that's you know probably the best part of it um who are you watching right now who are you checking for the toronto blue jays um i really need the toronto blue jays to like become somebody they got all these legacy kids between former um big league players i i just feel like like two three seasons ago Everybody was like, oh, the baby bigs, you know what I mean? They had all these guys that everybody was really pumped up about, but, mm -hmm. you know, they've had limited success. And that's not to say that they've been underachieving. Don't get me wrong, but there's a point that comes when you have a core group of players where you're either going to grow or you're not. I think that's the season for the Blue Jays. I'm not saying they're going to the World Series, but 
I do think that this team needs to take a step forward before they start reevaluating what it was they were doing to begin with. And they've got a heck of a lot of talent and they're super fun to watch. Any individual players, though, that you're Come like... Come on, man. Vladdy Jr., I was in your hometown, Shake, when the man sent 39 Rockets out of the park and didn't even win the dag on home run derby. He lost to Pete Alonzo. That was crazy. That was easily the best <laughs> home run derby I'd ever been to. It was a ton of fun. And your boy, CeCe Sabathia, threw a great charity party afterwards. It was fun. Speaking yes. of home run derbies, the, what is it? Swingman Classic coming up yes. this summer. Talk to me about the Swingman Classic. I assume you're going to go. Yeah. What do you know about it? What are you looking forward to with it? What does it mean? Swingman Classic HBU All, HBCU All-Star Game happening at the All-Star Game in Seattle. Um, sort of sponsored, speared on by George Kenneth Griffey Jr., you know, who is obviously many people's favorite baseball player of all time. Obviously one of the greatest baseball players of all time. Iconic human in American sports history. No questions asked. It was his idea. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you've never been to an HBCU baseball game, it is a little different than your average sort of D1 power five game in that. Yeah, it's very black. It is very different. It is closer to the soil of the game that I think most people who play a lot understand, even though the I don't want to say the talent level is lesser because I don't believe it's that. It's just yeah. that across the board, there's just a difference in how everything operates. And bro, it's fun. You know, speaking of Del Matthews, who I was just talking about, he played at Texas Southern for a while. He tells this great story about how when they used to play at Grambling and he played third base. And yeah. bro, if you kicked the ball at third, they had this boot literally on a chain <laughs> they would throw out. Like, Yo, you get the boot, you know what I'm saying? And like reel it back in. <laughs> Just to psych you out, point. which is hilarious. You know what I'm saying? Like you're not yep. seeing that in the Arkansas Tennessee matchup. That ain't happening, you know. <laughs> and it's just the culture of the game. There's a lot more chirping, and I just think that the the connectivity between sort of the the people in the crowd and the players on the field is a lot closer than it is at, a, at different levels of the game at different conferences in, in in D1. And you know, there's there's a lot of teams that. I think the HBCU situation regarding funding and why they're playing, shout out to the Winston-Salem State University team that had to fold a couple of years ago. Like there's a lot going on around these teams as to why they're not technically at the talent level, but that's HBCU problems we've been seeing for years, you know? So a lot of heart, a lot of soul in these programs, a lot of brothers that really do know baseball. We're not just rolling out teams just to say that we did it. Right. Uh, we got a question from Woody. He says, or they say, the pitch clock. Advantage pitcher or batter? I think that depends. You know, if you are acclimated to it, I think it's advantage manager in a certain sense. You know what I mean? Like as in, if you know that a guy is going to be better because he's more focused or a guy who doesn't take forever, you know, between swings to readjust to every single cutter or every single off-speed pitch he gets to readjust his batting gloves or whatever. Yeah, put that guy in. There's a little bit, there's a little bit more strategy than just between you know, the guy at the plate and the guy on the mound, my, my opinion, because it also speeds up everything that happens on the base pass as well. You know, between the throwover rule, between the, the shifts and between the pitch clock, there's a lot more things you have to pay attention to. I think you can't look at any of those in a vacuum, not remotely, because if you think about it, like faster pitch clock changes how you go, changes how you go to first or second. It changes how you operate on the infield, you know? And so I, look, what I like about it is that all of it has made the game kind of a different game that everybody's had to adjust to. And I think mm -hmm. that comes down ultimately to the managers. Do you have the personnel that can execute something with a new set of rules that's going to make your team better? Um, so more pitch clock stuff for me, but kind of. So have, have you, you've been to a game this season, right? No, I've not been to a game yet this season. Okay. I will be going to a college game, a high school game, and a minor league game, probably before I get to a big league game this season. For those of you who are wondering how I operate, that's how I operate. <laughs> you said from 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 the from 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 every level, yes. you're you're trying to see what's happening. Correct. Um, I do see what's happening. That's you do see true. that. That is true. That is true. I I get to follow along with your your baseball travels on Instagram. Thank you. Um, and I think it's super fun, by the way. Um. Stan wants to know, have you seen an increase in interest with Black youth and baseball? 
what I'll say is this. I don't know that I've seen an increase in interest in black youth in baseball. I've seen an increase in eyeballs on the black youths that have already and steadily been interested in baseball. And that's a big part of what this is all about. We be playing ball, y'all. Y'all just don't necessarily pay attention. I think of Atlanta as a hotbed for this in specific. Mm -hmm. My man Jordan Walker, by the by, who is a DH for the Cardinals right now. Man, this is a hoss. If you don't know who he is, look him up. And I just feel that, you know, when I went down to write a story about Michael Harris II, center fielder for Rookie of the Year for Atlanta, and I talked to his dad. His dad got inducted into the Alcorn State Hall of Fame as a baseball player. Bro, they got generations of guys that have been playing. And this wasn't necessarily news, but to see it in front of my face, it was just like, man, you know. And so when you ask me why I like to display, why I like to focus, and why I like to shine the light the best that I can on these players and these systems, that's why. You know, mm -hmm. people always talk about, oh, we got to get more black kids playing. We got to do this. We got to do that. Plenty of us playing. You know what I mean? The question is what happens in the scouting. The question is what happens in the recruiting. You know, and that's that's a big part. The question is what happens in funding for the places like HBCUs. What do we actually have to utilize is a different question than what our skill levels actually are. 100%. 100%. I think it's important to highlight who's there because it right now it looks like to a lot of people like, oh, there's a lot of black kids coming up. But look at how long they've been playing. Right. I've talked to some of these kids and they've been playing since they were at least three years old. Yeah. So, you know, they're having whole careers before, you know, the rest of America, so to speak, is paying I, attention. I, to I will say this, though, Shake, if you look at sort of what I'll just call the Omaha level of college mm -hmm. baseball, Almost every team with a shot at getting to the national championship has one or two brothers on them. That mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily the case 10 years ago. You know, now it's pretty much standard operating procedure that your power five schools will have a brother on the infield and maybe one on the outfield and probably one, you know what I'm saying, on their staff. And like, okay, you know, we can talk about progress. We can talk about this or that, but just in eyeball noticing, yeah, that has gone up in terms of the guys with the bigger programs saying, I could use some of that. Dag on real, you could. <laughs> I love it. Um, celebration in baseball. Um, it's starting to pick up a little bit. We got, we got the, you know, there was the the home run jacket. Um, there's the home run chains. Um, you think we're gonna see more of that? You think as as time goes on, it's gonna get even more flavorful? I put a delineation between dugout celebrations and on-field celebrations, okay, okay. not for any real reason other than if it happens on the field, I am 10 times more likely to think it's dope than if there's something concocted in the dugout. What happens okay. concocted in the dugout is between teams. You know what I'm saying? That's what y'all do to bond or whatever. And, you know, I get it. Those are always pretty much not inside jokes, but they're designed to sort of be funny. If it happens on the field, yeah, Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like you want to flip it to the moon. Okay. Like I, I, I like that. That to me is always going to be desirable. I can understand why people think that certain things off the field are a little bit much, but don't give it to me. If there's, you know, what are, you, what are we going to tell Barry Bonds if he decided to flip a bat? What are we going to say then? He takes Eric Gagne out, you know what I'm saying? To center off of a nine pitch at bat, which he yanks one foul in one Oh one. Look that at bat up. If you don't know it, if he flipped the bat, what were we going to say there? absolutely nothing you know and so for me there's a lot about baseball that people don't see in terms of y'all aren't y'all in at practice you know what i'm saying y'all are not watching a lot of these midweek games where dudes are doing all sorts of things that you wouldn't pay attention to one guy does one thing and everybody's like i can't believe that happened you'll believe it you know what i'm saying that's <laughs> how it goes barry bonds uh my favorite uh celebration is the pirouette like that's oh that's the the best the celebration. Hands in the air and the flip around. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> like I don't, I don't think there's anything more disrespectful yet amazing that has happened as far as those types of celebrations can go. Barry Bonds and is the best hitter of all time. Do not ask me because I will add to that if you start arguing with me that he's also the best baseball player of all time. So, let's talk about that. I, I have no arguments. Maybe someone watching um, has an argument. You, I I wrote a whole column about it. Right. Um, <laughs> um, I had a person email me and he was like, I'm sure you're getting a lot of messages today. And I was like, actually not, bro. Like it's just you. It's <laughs> not just as controversial you. as you think. <laughs> <laughs> right. Dude like, like, was nice, you know. It's just you. You're the only person who's upset by this. Um right. that's actually one of the first things I've written that got picked up like widely. And I was like, oh, I wonder how people are gonna respond, but it turned out pretty well. 
Yeah. Um, J.A. is asking, earlier you talked about Mar Marvin Freeman, Sarge, et cetera. Do you see a guy like Andrew McCutcheon being an advocate or mentor like that once his career ends? Seems he'd be perfect for it. Jay Asbury, I don't know you. I don't know where you're from, but I will utilize what your specific words are to make a different point about something else. You use the word advocate and mentor. Why wouldn't you just say manager? And the reason I ask that is because oftentimes that is apparently not the first thing that comes to mind when it comes to brothers in baseball. If a guy hangs around the league that long, if a guy is able to make that many rosters, if a guy's that good, trying to tell me he doesn't know a lot about baseball? All of these dudes that are managers in the big leagues these days, these dudes were not monster players. They were people that understood the game, came up through the system because they got a chance and they stuck with it. So yeah, advocate, mentor, sure. I think he'd be a good big league manager. How about we start there in terms of what the ceiling is and the base is of what it is we can do from an academic standpoint in the game. Ain't no reason we don't have more coaches all along the, you know, all along the joint. In, in, in professional baseball. I don't just mean in the bigs. I mean, going on down to the minors. There is a reason, but the reason is one that is obvious and it has to do with pay. It has to do with prejudice. It has to do with a lot of sort of things. And so, you know, like think bigger when it comes to us, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying you're not. I'm just saying that for everybody else who kind of looks at that as, no, you don't have to be in somewhere else. You could be in big league baseball. You know what I'm saying? Check out Johnny B. Dude's getting it done. <laughs> Uncle Dusty. Um, right. These will be the last two questions for you, Clem. Okay. How or why did the numbers of African-American players in MLB decrease in the 70s and 80s? And how have the numbers increased since the 90s? In the 90s, there was a change to the collective bargaining agreement that basically made it incentivized for baseball teams to have big stars and only prospects. That meant that the guys in the middle, your 20 through 25th guys on rosters, were considered less important. Guess who goes when that becomes the case? And so guys like, I think of Lenny Webster. Lenny Webster was a guy that was the backup catcher on the 91 Twins team. He learned how to catch in the minors and stayed on the team and was vital to a squad. That suddenly became less economically advantageous for baseball teams to try to take care of. And as a result, the sociology of America took over and all of a sudden there were no brothers around. I've said this before, I'll say it again. Black participation in baseball is not about the superstars. It's not about, as I said before, the Griffies, the Frank Thomases, the Jay Hayes. You know, it's about guys like, and again, get to your Wikipedias, kiddos, guys like Bill Hall. Bill Hall played in the league for 10 years and he played eight positions. You know what I'm saying? And like, as long as we have more of those guys, that's when you know the participation levels will go up. We cannot be expected to be the best player on every team, in every bullpen, on every staff. That's not how it is. If we can't be average, then we're not going to have a chance. And I think that's what's kind of going up a little bit right now is that people see brothers got skills on the diamond. They don't have to be the biggest stars on the field, even if they got swag. It doesn't necessarily mean that if they're not the number one run producer, they have no place on the team. That's what changed. Is Wu-Tang Financial your favorite Chappelle sketch or is it Prince's pickup basketball game? Oh, <laughs> um, my favorite Chappelle sketch. This is an impossible question. Um, obviously, a big fan of the racial draft. Uh, that's always funny. Uh, dang, there's also there's a sketch I can't talk about either. That's really hilarious. It's in black it's and white. Bush who's asking, so you can hit him up. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Don't be asking me questions about Chappelle. You know I'm from DC, and you know I'm gonna get myself in trouble talking about that dude. <laughs> we can take one more. We can take one more. All right, the, do we have one more question, y'all? Do we? Anybody, anybody? All right, well, you can ask one. Oh. How are you? Have you been to the park yet? I have not been to the park yet. I was on the women's basketball beat, so right. I have not been in the park yet, um, but I'm going probably next week. All right. It's supposed to be hot here. Well, well boys are out here putting up signs and crazy Thank words you for them, your so. time. This was super fun. Of course, Everyone say thank you to Clinton. Thank you, Clinton. Another shout out to the Bridge Progressive Arts Collective, Black-owned joint in Charlottesville, Virginia, one of the craziest places in America. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Have a good one. Bye, Clinton. Yep.